Well, good morning, good morning. I want to let you know. Can you hear me? Mikey, would you turn this up a little bit? I want to let you know if you're a guest, there's some coffee back there. We only have one pot, so we'll keep making it. The restrooms are back down this hallway to your right or left. And in a minute, I'm going to ask people to go say hi to people. So don't get freaked out when they come shake your hand or something. So I'm just preparing you ahead of time. And we'll set up some extra chairs. And mamas with babies, if your babies cry, we love that. Don't worry about it, all right? Your children are welcome here. We love your babies. Don't be nervous about that. I don't say the dad, that to the dads because they don't even care. So they're not paying attention to them anyway. But Often they don't even hear it. Because we can tune it out. See? Said the dad. Okay. All right, we're not only going to start on time, we're going to start one minute early. So if you, if you like to sing, join us in singing. You may stand or sit. And Tanya's going to lead us out of this song called I Got Saved. Let's sing together with her. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Since then I walked in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. Chains of the past are broken at last. I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. How could I want more? Received nothing but goodness. Oh, I've tasted and tested your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross and got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and Jesus, how could I want more? The love of God gave me his pardon. Oh, pardon the love of God me. won't let me stay the I'll same. Never be the same. The love of God calls me up higher. His will is stronger. That's why I got saved. Jesus, I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. I could I want more? I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. Jesus, I could I want more. I got Jesus, I could I want more. I got Jesus, I could I want more. Amen. Amen. All right, if you uh, if you don't know anyone in this room, you have to go meet them. Okay. That's all, y'all. Ready? Go meet somebody. Shake a hand in a couple of minutes. We'll call you back with some music.
How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken. Church, if you know it.
just just for a minute, if you'll if you'll if you'll allow me, if you ever went to Santa Fe South, graduated from Santa Santa Fe South, or are currently at Santa Fe South, or have a parent, or you're a parent of somebody at Santa Fe South, would you raise your hand? The saints are in the house right now. I am so glad to see you guys. It's okay, you can clap in this house. That's good. Now, I'm not disrespecting my redskins, right? I mean, I got a few of my red wolves and redskins in here, but Fernie, that was a long time ago, right? That was a long time ago. I am so glad. We, oh, this, oh, there's Spartan here too, right? Southeast, a couple of Spartans. Three? You guys all sit together, don't you? That's, uh, I am so glad to see so many that are here that are connected in so many ways. Families and friends, uh, athletes that have trained together, teachers and students and principals. This is such a great exhibition of our community today, and I appreciate a great deal being able to be here with you. It's such a beautiful day today to praise God. And as excited as I get about things like sports and academics, I am truly excited about the name of Jesus. This is the thing that gets me most excited to speak his name, to study his word, and to embrace one another in the love of God. So I'm glad we get to be here without pretense, without masks, without anything to worry about. Just be here, be loved on, listen to what God would say to you today, and enjoy this time and community. I love this song. Tanya's going to lead us out. You guys sing it if you know it. I've been held by the Savior I feel fire from above I've been down to the river Oh, I ain't the same A prodigal who returns Oh to a prison I've worn shackles and chains but I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back I'll never be the same Come that's on. why I sing all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday is gone. All my sins are forgiven. Oh, I have been washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that just breaks you down. Breaks you down to your knees God, I've been broken more than a time or two Yes, Lord But then you pick me you up pick me up And show me what it means to be free Everybody now All my hope is in Jesus Thank God Thank God that yesterday's 
Some of you guys didn't even know that song and you were singing it loud. That's how we sing around here, by the way. It doesn't really matter if you make a, a great sound. It just means it's good if you make a joyful sound. So the first way you do that by is actually smiling. Some of you are having difficulty with your faces right now. I know I'm always cranky looking. That's my job. But you guys, if you smile at me, I might smile back. It's also one of the easiest ways to relax. So, And as a choir teacher, I know you sing better when you're smiling. So work on it. We're going to smile a little bit as we sing this song. It's called What a Beautiful Name. You were the word at the beginning. One with God the Lord most high. you hid in glory in creation. Now reveal name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Make no mistake, there's no other reason that we gather today than to understand and know the person behind the name, Jesus. That's the whole reason that we're here. So if at the end of today I have not accomplished that, I haven't done what we've set out to do. If at the end of a song you haven't contemplated God or been drawn into an understanding or worship of him, the song has not accomplished what it's supposed to do. The only purpose of this building, in fact is to draw us into the contemplation of God. 
So I hope that's why you're here. I'm glad you're here. It's going to be good to eat together, but first we get to eat of the message that God has for us. I'm going to continue to sing one more song. The song is called Jesus, Only Jesus. Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. Who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us free? He paid it all to bring us peace. Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King, Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. Who can command the highest praise? Who has a name above all names? You stand alone and I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King, Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. You will command the highest praise. Yours is a name. Above all names, you stand alone, I stand amazed, Jesus, only Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King, Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore our joy. Jesus, only Jesus. You will command the highest praise. Yours is a name above all names. You stand alone. I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. Let's do that part again. Holy King, Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. You will command the highest praise. Yours is a name above all names. You stand alone. I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. Father, we are grateful that you give us music that is, in fact, your truth reflected back to you because we can't get it right on our own. So I thank you for giving us creativity as musicians and writers, but, Father, above all, a sensitivity to your truth so we can sing it and speak it. I pray that today your Holy Spirit speaks to every single human being, from the littlest to the oldest in this group, that your message to them, your love for us is clear. In your name we pray. Amen.
At this time, if you are third grade, is it third grade? I never get this here. What's that? Fifth grade or below, there's going to be a really cool, it's, pro it's probably going to be more fun in there than in here, honestly. So you adults don't sneak out. So third grade and below, and some adults, we may call you for some reinforcements in a minute. Well, can you hear me, Mikey? I think I'm unmuted. I am unmuted, and I'm on. How about now? Can you hear me now? OK. So every single first Sunday, for those of you that are normal attendees, what do we do here at, at the well? We eat. And so every single first Sunday, knowing that we will eat, I have two options when it comes to length of sermon. One is knowing that you don't have to go home and prepare or go wait in line at CC's. I can go longer, knowing that lunch is right in there. And, and the other is, knowing that lunch is right in there, I should go shorter so we get to lunch faster. So I'm never really sure how it's going to go, and I confess to you that even this morning I don't know. So one way or the other, lunch is going to be in there afterwards. Now we have an item of business to take care of before that lunch. And the sooner all of, all of you, who, who? all y'all, comply with that, or all y'all. Now, some of you are thinking, what he's going to say to me doesn't apply, but it applies to all y'all. We will come up here after some of our young men have taken these speakers down and raised the screen and put some chairs in, and we will all stand here, sit here, or kneel here for a group picture. It is our tradition on our anniversary that no matter who is in the building, whether they've ever been here before or are never coming back, you get to be in the picture, right? That's just the way we roll. It's just our snapshot, literally, of that day and time. So you can resist it now, and you can work up your arguments, but just discard them because all y'all get to be in the picture. Got it? Dr. Collins, that means you as well. Amen. Okay, all right. So what I, I didn't know that... I, I've got so many pastors here today. I should have one of you guys. There are like four pastors in this group. We've got the Barunda family visiting with us today. I'm so glad that Ever is here. He was one of my soccer players at Capitol Hill. He's a minister in South Oklahoma City with his family now. I'm so glad that they're here. Pastor Pete Dominguez only worked in ministry for like 65 years? 41 years. And can preach his way. I mean, unbelievable. And Dr. Dr. Collins, I'm really glad he's here. I didn't know he was coming, but he's... Uh, uh, the director of missions for the Union Baptist Association was instrumental in helping us get the well started nine years ago. How many of you were here that first Sunday nine years ago? You guys are like lifers around here. It's so good to see. And that's almost everyone, by the way. There were a few more, but that's almost everyone that was here nine years ago. And I can't believe we started this little gathering nine years ago. And by the way, don't, don't think this is how big we normally are. We just called a lot of friends today because we're eating lunch, and I'm glad you are here. We want you all back. But God has kept us deliberately small so that we can care well for one another. And we want to invite you to be a part of this small group to care well for one another because we need you. We need you to be a part of this. Today I'm going to talk about you and the way that God has created you in uh, the image of our creator. So sometimes I feel like sermons don't apply to me. Sometimes I feel like I, I'm not quite to the level the preacher is at, or sometimes I'm thinking he's preaching on something that doesn't have relevance. I can assure you that today's message encompasses every one of us, every single one of us. So I want you guys to hang in there with me because we are quite the group today. In fact, I could not have picked a better group or gathering for this particular sermon. I didn't know everyone would be here, but represented here are those who've been born in Oklahoma and those who have been uh, in Oklahoma their whole lives. And there are people in this group that were born in other countries. There are people who have lived in different states and several different countries. Recently, there are people who come from all backgrounds. Some people thrive in formal education and have their doctorates and their master's degrees, and there's some people who are just glad they finally escaped from high school because it was meaningless to them when they were there. There are some people here who are fantastic craftsmen, 
and there are some people here who have to call those craftsmen because we can't fix anything. There are artists among us who are gifted guitarists and percussionists and, and songwriters, and there are people who know how to, to play the radio in their car and appreciate that kind of music. There are physicians and doctors and educators. There are athletes and spectators. There are mamas and dads and grandparents and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters. There are people who have significant amounts of money in their bank account, and then there are most of the rest of us. There are people here who absolutely love church and come all the time, and there are people who only come to church when their mama drags them to church. We are a very diverse bunch. I could go on and on, but we are an incredibly diverse bunch racially and in age and in background and in understanding. But today I can assure you that we are absolutely unified and that there is one God who made each of us. One God who made each of us. What a beautiful God to be this creative, this diverse. I mean, look around for a minute. Y'all are a different bunch of folk. No, for real, right? Some of you got hair, some of you are bald, some of you are... You know, look good in glasses. Some of you need bigger glasses. Some of you uh, look better when we don't have our glasses on. Some of us like to dress fancy, and some of us just barely leave the house with clothes on. We are as different as we can be, right? Some of us are chosen by God, and we love OU, and then there's some cowboy fans in the house here, and all across the board. I love the fact that the community of believers, the community of followers of Christ, is rich and diverse. And it mirrors our God. So pay attention today, because we are a beautiful mixture of folk. And despite the real, real beauty found in our diversity, we can see even more profoundly the hand of our maker in the things that identify us as similar. So even while we identify our differences, in fact, we do that most often through social media, how different we are, or through our politics, how different we are, or through our socioeconomic status or the neighborhood or the school that we go to, how different we are. We are far more common in God than we are different. We can see that not just necessarily in our physical makeup, which by the way, although we think we're different, we are genetically almost identical to one another. You guys know that, right? There are very few tweaks in our DNA code that give us different hair color or different eye color. But as a species, we are clearly very, very similar. We even have interchangeable parts on occasion, right? I may have some part that you need. You may have some part that I need. And God has designed us where we are that much alike that we can exchange our blood to save a life, our organs to save a life. We are similar in the way that we can conceive and think of things as well. But to understand our, our, our similarities to one another, it's even more important to have our identity and relationship in God established at the very, very beginning. See, in the beginning, God had been busy. I mean, you guys remember, generally speaking, the very first chapter of Genesis. I'm not going to make you quote it or what day was this thing created or anything like that, but it starts at, in the beginning, God, right? Which is the foundational belief system that I believe everybody in this room has today. In the beginning, at the start of all things, there was the God of all things who created everything. In the beginning, God. And honestly, if that's not your point of departure, we part ways here. Right? I respect and love you, but we will not agree on many things beyond this point if we don't believe that the very beginning was God and as John says, the word was God, and the word was with God, and through him all things were created. Amen. And in Genesis, it says this in chapter 1, verse 27. Now, God had been busy. He'd been busy creating things in succession. We see the formation of the universe, the crafting of the very physical laws that govern us, and all living things placed into creation. He created the birds and the fish and the land animals. And then in verse 27, his greatest creation, mankind, comes into being. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, 
male and female, he created them. I want to read it again because this is our foundational piece today. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And it's from this verse that we can start to build the fullest understanding of who we are and how we should relate to one another. It's from this verse we can find our worth. Some of us wonder about that on a daily basis. Our purpose. Anybody ever thought about that? What am I to do? What am I to be? And the very meaning of our existence. This is the singular question that all sentient beings will struggle with at some point or at many points in their life. What is the meaning of my existence? It's from this verse we understand that we have a beginning, but we have no end. We have a beginning, but we have no end. God had no beginning and has no end. Animals have beginnings and ends, but we have a beginning and no end. We will always exist, not as we currently are, but we will always exist. And it's critical that we understand that God said he created us, and he created us in his image, and he created us equally, male and female. You know, in the verses preceding verse 27... It's mentioned some ten times that the created things are made according to their kind. According to their kind. So all the created beings were made according to their kind. But when he creates man, the pattern changes. We are created not according to our own kind, thank God, but in his image. But in his image. You know, in mythology and and in comic books, We often see a story thread that's built that is designed to explain the superpowers of the superhero or the villain. You know the story of Peter Parker being bitten by the radioactive spider, and he became who? Spider-Man, thank you, right? And we know that Superman is, in fact, a normal man on his home planet, but when he came to our planet, he has exceptional powers, and Wonder Woman was from this, like, weird race of women that just kicks everybody's butts, and that's where her story came from. And so every one of our superheroes or supervillains has what they called uh, an origin story. There's a word in French, which I sort of struggle to say, but it's pourquoi. The pourquoi. It's the story of origin in myth. The pourquoi. The beginnings of. And this is the circumstance under which the life of an otherwise normal human being acquire special or superhuman abilities to place them above other human beings. It's what makes something a superhero or supervillain. You know, in many ways, we need to look at all humans in this way. Because if you understand that we were not created after the fashion of or according to their kind, as animals were, but in fact we are created in God's image, we are exceptionally super created beings. This is a really interesting thing that the secular world has no case with. They don't believe this. In fact, there are people that literally believe you are as valuable as an animal, and in many cases, less valuable than some animal. There are people who literally believe that flora and fauna supersede the value that it is plants and animals are more valuable than the human beings who inhabit the earth. That is not true. We are literally super beings because we are created in a metaphysical way from the very beginning in the image of God. Some of you guys are like, this is getting pretty mystical. It is factual. It is the truth. We are not just biological entities. We haven't evolved from a primate species or out of the primordial soup. We were created as living, thinking, sentient beings in the image of God, which places us at the very top of all orders. Human beings are supernatural in their origin. We have to remember this because if we don't get this, we don't understand that we are like no other. We're like no other. 
Our origin story is the Imago Dei, the made in the image of God. Imago, the root word for the word image. Dei, deity, the root word for deity or God. We are literally, according to the scriptures, created in the image of God. Of God, if you had a bad hair today, day, bad hair day today, get over it. If you've had a rough week about your own personal self-esteem, I'm telling you, get your perspective straight. We are made in the image of God. He created us, specifically designed us, breathed us into existence, not just Adam and Eve. He didn't start this as some sort of agnostic clockmaker and put a breeding pair on the earth and then step away to see what would happen. God created Adam and Eve, and then he created Cain and Abel, and then he created Seth, and then he created the whole line of people that eventually spread out and included you and me. God created us individually. Shariah was asking about age, trying to figure out why we're not considered born at conception, which I think is a very valid question, by the way, right? Why our birth date is not, in fact, conception date. It's a little awkward to go back and ask your mom and dad about that, first of all. It's just a weird conversation. So it's easier to go with the whole birthday thing. But it is true. Our life began by God at a very intentional time. Our physical life will end, no surprise to God, although it may surprise us, at a very specific time. Our days are numbered. You all know that, right? Even you teenagers who think you're absolutely bulletproof, your days are numbered. Our days are numbered. In fact, the moments tick by in our physical lives and move us toward our eternal lives. And we are to confront our existence, our spirit's existence, even while in our physical bodies. The Bible is clear about that. This is what one author says about the sort of definition of imago Dei. It comes from the Latin version of the Bible, translated to English as in the image of God. Image of God is defined as a metaphysical expression, which is just a way of thinking about where we come from, our reality of existence, associated uniquely with humans. No other species, as much as I love my dogs, they don't have a soul. They might, but the Bible doesn't tell us about that. Jesus didn't come to seek and save the lost Labrador. He came to seek and save us, right? I love animals. I think they're delicious. I think everybody should have some for lunch. But God came for us. He He has brought us into existence to be in relationship with him. The phrase has its origins in Genesis 1, 27, wherein God created man in his own image. But this biblical passage does not imply that God is in human form. There was a while back where they were trying to describe with the 400-foot Jesus or something like that. You guys remember the 400-foot Jesus guy? Where they were talking about the physical manifestation of God, which is something we've always struggled with. Although we have facets of, and there are parts and pieces and characteristics of God in all of us, he doesn't look like Pete Dominguez. Amen, Amen right? He doesn't look like Chris Brewster. He doesn't look like Victor Macias. He doesn't look like Rocky Beltran, although he might be big like that. Rocky's pretty big. He, he doesn't look like us, so it's not a physical representation. We can't expect that when we see God that he will have ten fingers and ten toes. That's not what we're talking about in the image of God. We're talking about this next piece, that humans are in the image of God in their moral, spiritual, and intellectual essence. Thus, now pay attention to this, humans reflect God's divine nature in their ability to achieve the unique characteristics with which they have been endowed. It means that God has given us potential and the ability to reach that potential. It means that God has placed his standards within us and given us the ability to meet those standards in the way we choose to live our lives. It means that God has given us a God-shaped understanding of our world and expects us to act and think and function through that understanding. He is our lens, our filter through which we should see everything in our lives. These unique qualities make humans different than all other creatures. You're supernatural. You're supernatural. Rational understanding is not something your cat has, especially your cats. They are not rational. They're just cats. 
Rational understanding is something we have. Creative liberty is something we have. No matter how much they make those elephants in India make paintings that people buy, you know those elephant paintings, which are kind of cool, but it's not creative liberty. The capacity for self-actualization. I can think and do things on purpose and with intent to be strategic in my life. These are the things that God has placed within us and the potential for self-transcendence. Now, you think about that. That sounds kind of humanistic. I want to make sure you understand the way I think this is written. Self-actualization means you can get up in the morning and do the right thing. You can overcome your evil human nature through the power of God and do the right thing. You can transcend yourself to be God-like. He calls us to be Christians, to be Christ-like. You know, I'm like my dad in many ways. My, uh, I can't raise one eyebrow like he does, but I got the look if I need the look. My dad has a look, and his has a one eyebrow up, but I've got the look when I need it. I can fix stuff. Uh, my dad can fix anything. He's just like that. He understands the ways that things work. I, I've got some of his ability to teach and to, to preach and to speak and to write. I'm also kind of like my mom. I love family. I just assume they all stayed in my house and never moved out. My wife feels more intelligently that they should move out at some point. And I would probably go with her. I love having family together. I like uh, hospitality. I like uh, those types of things that my mom has. I've also inherited some of their physical traits. I've got my mom's bunions, and I'm passing them on to my kids. Kids are coming your way. They were my grandma's and her grandma's before that. They're coming yours. You get the bunions. I've got my dad's basic height and hair, and hair color. I'm like my parents in many ways. In fact, you know when a doctor interviews me, if I'm going and interviews me, I guess it's an interview, and, and, for, and they ask me my family history. Why do they ask me a family history? I, I'm here. Why do you need to know about my, my family history? What do they want to know? Because many of the things my family had, they handed on to me, whether I wanted them or not. There's a pretty good potential for Alzheimer's in my family. Somebody better cure it quick because it's been passed on for a while, right? There are physical traits that we picked up that will be passed on, and they want to make sure that they treat me in a particular way, knowing my nature. You know, what will we do with a knowledge of our true family origin? Just like a doctor designs his treatment protocol for me, if he knows my family background or she understands where I'm coming from, what will we do to design our lives based on from whence we came. The God of the universe that created us as supernatural beings and breathes out his life through us expects us to be supernatural in the way we think about this. Our understanding of where we come from should impact us in regular ways. Let me give you three things I want us to think about. First of all, we can better understand our God and how we relate to him when we understand that we are created in the image of God. We can better understand our God and how we relate to him when we better understand that we are created in his image. Number two, we can better understand ourselves and how we can relate to ourselves. I used to be fairly certain I knew who I was when I was about five. And then the older I get, the more confused I made myself. I mean, Paul talks about this in the doo-doo verse. Why do I do that which I wish I did not do? And I cannot do that which I wish I could do. Why am I so messed up? The older I get, the weirder I am, and the less I understand myself. But we can understand that we are made in God's image and begin to understand ourselves better because of that relationship. And thirdly, we can better understand others and how we should relate to others if we understand that we are made in God's image image. Let's dive into this. First of all, we can better understand our God and how we relate to him. You know, we have to understand, first of all, the fullness of our condition. And while we were created in the image of God, and he designs us to live in harmony with him and with others, as creatures given free will, we have all chosen to turn away from our perfect beginning and are fully corrupted by sin. Dang. Sometimes I just wish people would tell me what to do and to make me do it. Don't you? 
I remember seeking God's will when I was in college and saying, God, if you would just send me an email or a telegram or Pony Express or something that just says, go do this on this day and this way, I am ready. I want to be a soldier. I don't want to think about this stuff. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do. Who am I supposed to marry? What am I supposed to study in college? Where am I supposed to work? Just give me my marching orders. Has anybody ever been there before where you just wish God would lay it out? Just give me a text. Tell me what I'm doing today. I'm going to go do it. Now, knowing myself like I do now, what do you think I would do with those marching orders when I got them if that really happened that way? Wait now. That was not the question I asked right there, Sharifa. What do you think I would do if God sent me a list, an itinerary of what I'm supposed to do? I procrastinate. Probably, man, it's getting personal. How do you know me that way? I've, I've put it off, right? I might soup it up a little bit. I got a little better idea. I can take that idea and I can ramp it up a little bit. Because I go big or go home. You guys know that about me. I'm always starting stuff, right? I have a way of improving it or a way of putting it off or a way of just flat out ignoring it because that's not me. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. I don't wish. So I know my cantankerous nature, and it's probably like yours. This whole free will thing messes us all up, but it also confirms that God loves us because he did not make automatons. He didn't make puppets. He didn't turn us into marionettes or robots. He didn't put an algorithm in us and say, I'm going to run you. He said, I created you to be in relationship with me, and real love comes both ways. God gives us all of his love and expects us and wants us and invites us to love him, but he never forces us to love him. And our free will has caused a cataclysmic divide between us and him. The Bible says it wrecked us. It destroyed us. It condemned us. It damned us. It removed us from the God that created us to be with him. We see this, again, articulated in this idea about the the beauty of the image of God also having another side to that coin. He states this, the significance of humans being created in the image of God is our responsibility to recognize and understand rationality and ability to create abstract conceptions in the natural world. This gives us the ability, the writer says, to create a glorious and peaceful world or a fallen, chaotic environment. We literally could stop killing each other right away. Y'all know that, right? Like humanity tomorrow could stop killing each other. Tomorrow we could never rape another person, abuse another child, molest anybody, steal from somebody, take advantage of somebody over tomorrow, just like that. Could we not? We have free will. All of the world could experience God's shalom, his peace, if we chose to love him first and others as an outpouring of that. But we don't. This image of God, this power that God gives us in free will, allows us to create chaos or to create harmony. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't understand why he doesn't just go, starting over. And we're all just a greasy spot on the ground. He did a couple of times, but he didn't wipe us out entirely. But he allows us to maintain. Just as Satan fell from God, we are capable of falling from God and suffering consequences. We must realize our dual potential, which is that good versus evil, that that we talk about the the Native American lore about which wolf will you feed, which dog will you feed, which part of our nature will you support, the one that does evil and destroys or the one that does good and supports. And we have a tendency to be bipolar in our approach, up and down in our lives, sporadic in our following of the things that God has given us. We must realize our dual potential and act in accordance with God's will, not ours, and, and, and law to create prosperous and benevolent communities and nations. And when we get it right, we can see God's kingdom come on earth as it is 
in heaven. Jesus prayed for that because it can happen, by the way. He prayed for that. Jesus doesn't pray for stuff that can't happen. He prayed that God would see his kingdom come on earth as it does in heaven. The only way it happens in our portion of the earth is if we submit to God's will and suppress our will. Romans, we've all been given the opportunity to choose whom we'll follow. Our evil nature or place our faith in Christ who redeems us back into a right relationship with God. The Bible is unequivocally clear that we cannot earn our way back to a right standing with God. One sin, one billion sins are equal in poisoning our relationship with the one that created us, period. It is God and everybody else. There is not a really good person close to God, my grandma, who is just almost God. Nope, she's as fallen as the worst sinner. Our sin has condemned us equally. And Jesus' blood has redeemed us equally as well. We have the opportunity through faith in Jesus Christ to accept what the Bible calls grace. It's this undeserved love. Some of you may say, I don't deserve that. Bruce, you don't even know what I have done. I do know what some of you have done. I was your principal and your coach and your teacher, so I know what some of you have done. Right? I know what some of you have done. I've seen it on Facebook. That's why I don't on Facebook anymore. I know what we are, and God still says, I love all of it. I came to save the whole world. Not just the ones I, that I like, the whole world. And some of you need to contest that reality in your life today, whether or not you have a right standing before God through your relationship with Jesus. Paul put it really concisely in Romans 3, verses 21 through 24. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness have, of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. You see, there are two pathways to redeem our relationship with God. There are only two pathways. One is you live an absolutely perfect life. You never make a mistake. Absolutely perfect life. So those of you that want to choose that, you're first in line for lunch because you are perfect. The Bible also says there was only one perfect human being. And that was Jesus Christ. The second way and the only hope we have is that we can go through on the sacrifice of the one who was perfect. That's Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And what Paul says is you can sacrifice and you can live well and you can say I'm sorry and you can plead on, on God for, for, for repentance and for, for, for salvation, but unless Jesus Christ has saved you, you have no hope. No hope. This righteousness, verse 27, is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Any Jews in here? We're all Gentile, right? So thank God he spoke through Paul, through Jesus, through the apostles later on to say this salvation is not just for the Jews, the chosen people, but for everyone that will come both here and far away. We're the far away people. We're the ones that he was speaking about. For all have sinned, verse 23, and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Without Christ, we can no longer relate to God in the way that he intended us to. But I go to church a lot, Brewster. I, I memorize the whole Bible. I got nothing but Caleb on all my presets. I don't watch any of those movies. My kids don't dress in an embarrassing way, I'm a good person. I pay my taxes. None of that rectifies our situation. None of it. None of it. Only Jesus Christ can save us. Amen. To be made in the image of God is to understand the perfection of God, our imperfection, and desire to be made right with God through Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that I want you to take from today, if you take only one thing from today. That your heart can only be made right with God through Jesus Christ. The second thing, we can better understand ourselves and how we relate to ourselves. We are his. We're his. That's my wife. My wife, right? Those are my daughters. 
They're all over the place. And sons, a few of those. They are my people. They're my family. And as powerfully as I feel for my people, that is a fraction, an infinitely small amount of what God cares for us. Infinitely small. As great as our love is for one another, for those babies that Kevin has, for a baby on the way that Axel Will has, for our loved ones that we hold dear, as close as we hold them, God holds us closer. He adores us more than Matt and Ophelia adore Ava. Is that possible? It's not just possible, it's true. The Bible says you are the apple of his eye. Which I don't really know what that means, but I know it's a good thing, right? You're the apple of his eye. He adores you. No, he doesn't adore me. He might have liked me when I was a kid before I messed up. He adores you now, right now. He knows all the stuff you did Friday night, last Friday night, 75 Friday nights ago. He knows everything you're going to do in the future. He knows how jacked up your thoughts are, and you're barely holding it together right now. He adores you, every bit of you. He knows you better than you. He loves you on your worst day as much as he loves you on your best day. You're made in God's image. You're his kid. Some of us need to get that right standing in our mind. We need to begin to view ourselves with the adoration that God has for us. Because if we don't, we get all messed up. We don't think we're worth it, and we sell out in relationships. And we hurt ourselves with with chemicals and mind-altering drugs, and we do crazy stuff like trying to seek job satisfaction and economic levels and value ourselves in a different way. God loves you. Whatever your hairstyle, whatever your state of mind, no matter what you feel or what you have done, God loves you completely. Am I getting the message across to you right now? God loves you. You're made in his image. We can see that because he made all of us, that God adores diversity. You know that, right? He doesn't have a particular size person that he likes more than somebody else. He doesn't have a particular hair color he likes more than anything else. He doesn't like a particular eye color more or skin color more. When our daughters first came to us, they had come from a a background that had taught them to value skin color, variations. And it's taught in our society, you know, the darker you are, the less value you have. Unless you're a white person, then you want to be dark, right? And the whiter you are, the less value you have. Whatever you are, you don't want to be that. We're all unsatisfied. God made your skin color exactly that color on purpose. And he was thrilled. He made your hair that way. Mine's going really gray right now, really gray. And he made it that way, so I need to deal with it. He made us the height we are and the size we are, the intellectual capacity we have and the creativity we have and the sense of humor we have. He made us in his image, all of us. Now, I may not like what Mikey does, but God likes Mikey. God made Mikey. And it teaches me a lot about how God is and how I should relate to myself because we're both very different in God. God made us. He does diversity. He has creativity and humor. God is driven and thoughtful and loving. These are characteristics. He's a giver of talents and aptitudes and abilities, and he has dispersed these liberally to his people. He's given you gifts you haven't even discovered yet. You can be like 60 when you decide you're going to try something and you find out you're phenomenally gifted at it. And your goofy mind will say, well, I should have started that when I was a teenager. And God said, no, I wanted you to learn it now. Oh, we've got a friend, Sandra Harriman, who started oil painting when she retired. She's amazing, like phenomenal. She was a school counselor for years, felt like God was wanting her to start painting. I'm like, well, you're retired, go paint something. She's good, like, like cell painting's good. There are gifts that you will discover that God has hidden like Easter eggs in a video game. Your whole life, you go, well, I'm pretty good at that. There are relationships that you will have. All kinds of things that God has given you because he is a God that adores you. Because he adores you, 
We should learn to adore ourselves. God has created us in his image. And when you say, I hate me, what are you saying to the one that created you? If you say, I am dissatisfied with the way I am, then you're saying, God, you messed up. My little brother had a little, a little mirror with a picture on it that he won at the state fair. One of those goofy, you throw a ball at something, they give you a prize worth eight cents or something. But it said, I know I'm worth something because God don't make any junk. My brother needed to hear that at that point. He was struggling with learning disabilities. All he has now is a nursing degree. He's running in the ER room of his little hospital. He's doing all right. At that point, he didn't feel like he had any ability, and God was communicating, God didn't, I don't make any junk. You need to discover what I've created you for. When we do that, we know how to relate to ourselves. David wrote often of this, and we see it beautifully expressed in Psalm 139. We know we are phenomenal, and God seeks restoration and healing and fills us with hope and longing to become better human beings. That's because God designed us, not because we're bent that way. In Psalm 139, 1 through 18, I'm not going to comment on any of this. I try not to do that. I'm going to read this. I want the word of God to wash over you as you hear these words. And we've been studying, for those of you that have been here, we've been studying the life of David for several months. And it ain't pretty. When you get down into the, the down and dirty and the gritty life of David, it's a whole lot more than he threw some rocks at a giant. It is a bad, bad, rough picture. But this is a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. And when you read a psalm like this, you get it. You understand that David was just like us, only he wrote really well. Uh, Some of you might be able to write like this. I sure can't write like this. He wrote really well, and he emulates the feelings that we have toward God and understands the feelings that God has toward us. So hang in there. Let me read these verses to you. Psalm 139. For the director of music of David, a psalm. You have searched me, Lord. And you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, Darkness is as, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days before me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. David was overwhelmed that God knew him from conception and knew everything he would do and David knew everything that he had done and he was overwhelmed at God's love and grace for him anyway. When we know that we are created in the image of God, we can better understand and how we relate to ourselves and finally we can better understand others and how we are to relate to others. The God who is revealed in Scripture is a God of peace and mercy. He's also a God that requires justice and provides grace. Victor and I were talking about this a little this morning. He's mentoring a group of young men. 
and coaching others. And sometimes you get frustrated when those that you're mentoring don't do what you're supposed to do. And you're like, man, how do I handle this? And I, I stress to him that when I parent well, when I parent well, both spanking and hugging are signs of love. And both grounding and buying ice cream are signs of love. And both words of praise and words of correction are signs of love. God is a perfect father. He is a God that demands justice, but he provides salvation through grace. He does not overlook our sin. He paid the price for it. He gives us latitude and forgiveness and still expects us to live as Christ followers in the way he has outlined in Scripture. It is both held in eternal tension until God redeems us into perfection in heaven someday. God is a God of peace and mercy and justice and grace. He's a God of judgment and redemption. He brings the dead back to life and gives life abundant to those who choose him. It is this truth that we can find and how to relate to the humans around us. One more passage, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 17. You see, there was a, there was a song I used to be familiar with when I was a, in high school. They'll know we are Christians by our love, right? By our love. They'll know we are Christians by our love. In a northeastern Luzon, where my parents were missionaries, there was a really bad typhoon that came through one time. There were always bad typhoons. This was a really bad typhoon. And typhoons are not like tornadoes. They don't just come flatten your house and move on. They come in for a few days of low pressure, three days of really hard rain and winds, and then maybe three more days of crazy hard rain and winds. Then the thing passes over you, calms down, and then you're on the backside of it for six more days. It is a horrifically long, it's a typhoon, is a hurricane spinning the other direction. They're, they're, they're really crazy storms, and this was a bad one. It came through and destroyed over 18,000 homes in our town alone. Businesses were wiped out. I mean, the place, there's no electricity, no running water anymore. The place is just demolished. Filipinos are resilient people. They're helpful people. They were recovering, but it would take a long time to do so. And so some relief goods were sent through the uh, Foreign Mission uh, Board, the IMB, International Mission Board now, for missionaries to disperse. And we bought roofing and food and medicine and supplies uh, to disperse to people, to help people in chronic need. And so that they would know who we were when we came in, they just put banners on the sides of the trucks that said, Southern Baptist, people who care. People who care. We drive into a barrio, we help. Um, I remember carrying roofing and bags of rice and roofing and bags of rice and roofing. I mean, we just carried for days and days and days and days. And then the, the recovery kind of took place and people got back to normal. But for years, years, Southern Baptists in the Philippines, in the northern part of the Cagayan Valley, were known as people who care. Oh, you're the people who care. Because it wasn't just something people said, it was something that people did. I'm a Christian. Oh, you are? Hmm. Have you looked at your Insta? Does your pastor know about your Facebook? You think your grandma will be pleased with that social media posting? Ooh, you're a Christian? That's like a little C Christian, right? That's like you're going you're gonna to be a, you're going to level up someday and be a Christian because there's inconsistencies in our lives, right? We say we are little Christ. They say if you were put on trial to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict? And that's a good question to ask. Ask, is there a confirmation in the way we live that confirms we want to be known as followers of Christ? The Bible says, oh, no, we're Christians by our love, not by our church attendance. Not by our ichthus fish stickers on our cars and our Christian jewelry. It says they will know us by our love. Do we take care of people we don't even like? Do we act right around people who are mean to us? Do we express, I'm asking me these things. I'm just saying them out loud to y'all. Do we act right in our business setting? Are we upright in the way we do with one another? Paul writes to the Colossians in chapter 3 and says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Because you have been raised with Christ, set your heart 
on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Get your eyes up. Get your heart up. Get your mind up. Get your actions up. Stop acting like the world if you are not of this world. If you are strangers and aliens, as the Bible says we are for Christ followers, then act like you don't belong here. Act in a way that the world would be confused by because of your love and your behavior. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's the old you. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then also you appear in glory. Put to death, therefore. That's pretty straightforward. It's not like wean yourself off of your porn. Wean yourself off of that negative relationship, that sexual immorality in your life. Wean yourself slowly away from cheating on your taxes. Wean yourself, it said, put to death. That's pretty straightforward. Put a knife in it. Whatever belongs to your earthly na nature. And he goes on, just in case, because Paul wanted to make sure we understood what we're supposed to understand. He lists stuff. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, he said, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. Man, that's hard. Yeah, it is hard, hard, because those are things that are embedded in our old nature. Paul says, put them to death. And follow your new nature in Christ. The Holy Spirit will empower you. Good people around you will encourage you. The word will direct you. And you can put to death your old nature. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices. And put on the new self. Which is being renewed in the knowledge. In the image of its creator. Oh I get it. When I know I'm more in God's image. I can act right. Yes that's how this works. You mean when I see myself made in God's image, I understand how God would want me to react to other human beings? Yeah, that's how it works. How I can perceive myself and to know God when I realize that the Imago Dei is a true principle that I am made in His image. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself. He told us what not to have and what to get rid of. Now He's saying, here's what you get to have. Clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. By the way, all of those are things that you show by the way you act with other people. Right. right? Compassion and kindness and gentleness and humility is not what God asks us to show him. If we're not kind to him, he can thump us on the head. He'll take care of us. He tells us to show this by the way we act around other human beings. Bear with other, each other and forgive one another. If you, if any of you has a grievance against someone, nah, 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 you don't know what she did. You don't know what he said. Nah, forgive one another. That's hard to do. Hard to do. When our self-worth is tied up in what some other person thinks about us, it's hard to do. But when our self-worth is tied up in the fact that we are made by God in his image, we can forgive other folk. We can let it go. We can lay it down. Even if they don't deserve it, God says forgive them. Just as I have forgiven you, by the way. You didn't deserve it. Bear with each other. Forgive. Verse 14. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Then it's not just a bunch of church rules. You act this way because you love people. You choose these things. And then he says, let the peace of God a peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul just was just spewing out this goodness. He couldn't stop just giving them this advice. He was writing as if their lives depended on it, which they, of course, did, and ours do. The abundant life that is available to us is only found through Christ. In conclusion, 
How does it feel if someone says to you in kindness and admiration and with love in their voice, you're just like your daddy? Or you're just like your mama? You're just as beautiful as she is. You're just as strong as your dad. How does that feel? That's good, right? That's good. How would it feel? You say, you're just like your heavenly father. You are full of love and grace and forgiveness. And I've been mean to you and you still accept me. I'm unreasonable and you still let me in your house. I've said bad stuff about you and you still forgive me. Man, you're just like, you're just like Jesus. You're just like Jesus. You know, when we hear that kind of affirmation, just like your daddy, you get kind of bashful, right? You get kind of, kind of grateful. How much more so should we be desired to be like our creator, our heavenly father? You know, we're made in the image of God. And our lineage, therefore, is one of royalty and power and infinite love and grace of perfect redemption and purpose in this life. That's what we get. That's who we are. That's the lives we lead. And I pray that today you are in a right and restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that today maybe you got a better picture of what it means to be made in the image of God. In fact, I pray that your vision is 2020 today. And that for the rest of this year, you understand how God perceives you, that he adores you, that he has strengthened and equipped you to be the people that he designed you to be. Amen? Amen. I'm going to conclude this, but if God is working in your heart, don't let you be concluded with him. Some of you are like, man, I'm, that's a good talk and all, but I don't know about this, this Jesus thing. And some of you do know about this Jesus thing, and you've been putting him off a long time. But God speaks your heart language. And you know what he's saying to you. Don't leave this place today without talking to me or another believer and helping us help you accept salvation from Jesus Christ. I'm glad you're here. I'm overwhelmed that you're here. I'm appreciative of you being here to study the word. And in letting me go 10 minutes over, we'll get to lunch. See, now you know which one I chose to go longer because you don't have to drive anywhere. We will. Thank you, Victor. I appreciate that. Um, we're going to ask the Lord's blessing on our food here. We're going to take our picture. Who? All y'all. Right here, taking the picture. And then we're going to line up. Ladies first. If there's any food left, the guys will eat. If not, I'll go buy some pizzas. We'll all eat. And uh, we'll eat together. I am going to ask that we put tables in like groups of four or five like we did last time so we can kind of sit with one another. But after I say... Amen. We're going to have some guys come up here and set up, and the rest of you kind of be ready to get up here right away for our picture. Got it? All right. Father, I thank you. I thank you for giving us your word in our language, in our vocabulary and vernacular, so we can understand a little bit of the truth. I thank you for making us in your image, helping us to recognize our supernatural origins. And we are truly above all other created beings and held accountable to you for that. I pray for these men and women that are here. That their hearts and minds be set on you. You fill us with the grace and goodness that can only come from you. We thank you for the food we're about to eat. I pray that you bless it to our bodies and that you multiply it to feed this great number of folks that are here. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name, we get to pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's set up and get this picture.